joy to me to worship God together again in this Lord's Day. <clears throat> this morning I've been thinking about a song that we've been singing a few times uh, quite recently, Higher Ground. The first line of that song is, uh, I'm pressing on the upper way, new heights I'm gaining every day. And if you're like me, to be honest, there's a lot of times where I feel like, well, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm gaining new heights each day. I don't feel like I'm reaching new levels of maturity or uh, deepening my faith each and every day. There are days you have bad days. Um, and there are things about that song that challenge me, and I think that's one thing um, about our worship as well. That we do, we come here to worship God and to remember His Son by taking the Lord's Supper. Um, but there is an aspect of worship that can challenge us, and that's really why we study the Bible together, um, so that we can you know, challenge ourselves to excel still more in our faith, in our service, in our love for each other, and in our devotion to God. And I encourage you to look for that as we study the Bible together this morning, and as we praise our Father in Heaven, and as we seek to um, achieve new heights in our worship and in our love for God together. We'll be led in an open prayer. Let's bow together. Our Father in Heaven, we come before you this morning praising you for um, all that you are and for the great blessings that you give us. We thank you so much that we can assemble here together for this blessing of, of fellowship and that we can join together and worship to you this morning to give you um, just a portion of the praise and the honor that you deserve as our God. Thank you this morning um, for the many blessings you give us. We thank you for Jesus, and as we remember him this morning um, in, our, in our Lord's Supper portion, we, uh, we pray that we would focus on him, and as we do every week, that we would uh, think about the life that he lived and the death that he died that ultimately gives us hope uh, of being with you, of eternal fellowship with you. We pray that our worship would be acceptable in your sight this morning, and we pray that we would be wholly devoted uh, in this, this hour of worship to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. First, we'll, we'll start with, bless me the time. Bless me the time that finds our hearts in Christian love.
give me the Bible. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wandering one and deathless heart. No sorrow can hide that greatest peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seal and stay the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall be. Bible reading will be from the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. While Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and the breast at which you nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, let's sing to Jesus, name above all names. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, 
so glad to be able to be together this morning to partake of the Lord's Supper together. As we do this, we all know that there are millions of people today who are gathered in cathedrals and chapels and in church buildings all over the world uh, to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Now we know with almost absolute certainty that Jesus was not born on the 25th day of December. We also know that nowhere in the Bible does it instruct us to have some kind of annual celebration of his birth. But that said, I still find it gratifying to know that we live in a world where there are so many people that at least acknowledge the singularly momentous event that Jesus' birth was. And I certainly think that it's appropriate to celebrate Jesus' coming into the world every day of the year. So that can be a good thing. And uh, it was a joyous occasion. The angel of the Lord proclaimed the good news of great joy to all people. And the shepherds and the wise men and devout Simeon and Anna, they all celebrated the birth of Jesus and rejoiced over it. Um, all births are happy occasions, but this birth was extra special. So, and it was so worthy of celebration because of what the angel said on the night that Jesus was born. It says in Luke 2, 11, For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus was born to be our Savior, and that's why we celebrate him. Uh, but what made Jesus our Savior and Savior of the world was not his birth. As singularly amazing as that birth was, God become flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. That's not what made him our Savior. Our Savior is forever linked to his death. Because it's through that ultimate demonstration that that love that he atoned for our sin. <clears throat> and though he was completely innocent and pure, just like he was when he was born, um, and now 30 some odd years later when he goes to the cross, he still is innocent and pure and without sin. But he took on the sins of the world and gave himself in our he became, uh, the Hebrew writer says, the author of our salvation. So while the world may uh, choose to celebrate Jesus' birth, we're gathered today to remember his death, to honor and reverence him in the way that he asks us to by partaking of these emblems, bread and wine, that represent his body and his blood. And in our own way, uh, we are celebrating our salvation and proclaiming his death until he comes again. And while our service may be uh, less uh, festive than some uh, who are emphasizing, emphasizing Christ's birth, I'm reminded of what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 3, it's better to go to the house of mourning than it is to go to the house of feasting. Because it's in these somber reflections where we consider Jesus' death, we come to understand the cost our salvation, and we recognize our own accountability for the suffering that he endured for us, and that should strengthen our faith and our resolve to live faithfully and to somehow seek to be worthy of that great sacrifice. I'll ask you to bow as we pray for the bread. Lord God, we give thanks for our Savior Jesus, who did what no one else could do. He atoned for our sins by taking the punishment that we all deserve. He died that we might live. And we're, we just thank you for sending him to be our Savior. We thank our Savior for giving his body on the cross. May we honor him as we partake of this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Jesus is the hero of all history. He's the hero of all who seek deliverance from Satan and from sin. He's my hero. He's your hero for all eternity. He will be. And I'd like to read a few 
verses from Hebrews chapter 2 that just emphasize this so well. It says, But we do see him who was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, from whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For this reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren, and in the midst of con the congregation I will sing your praise. Let's bow down. Father, we thank you for the salvation that Jesus brought into the world. He is the author of our salvation. Everything begins and ends with him. He tasted death and shed his precious blood on the cross so that we might be cleansed. And so we proclaim his name to our brethren. In the midst of the congregation, we receive praises to you. In Jesus' name. Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like him, his brethren, in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. I said earlier, Jesus is our hero. I don't know if we, we think of him as our savior, but I'd like for us to think of him in, in, in that regard, that he is the hero. He delivered us. He saved us. But he came to our rescue. And I love the way this passage states it. <clears throat> he came to free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their days. And the passage also mentions that he's not ashamed to call us brethren. He is like our older brother, our big brother, who comes and saves us. Uh, others might be able to relate to that, but having a big brother that comes to defend you. That's what Jesus did. He came and fought for us and defeated the devil and delivered us from harm. And he come and he doesn't stop. It says he comes to our aid when we are in need. That's our Savior. That's Jesus, who is our hero. Let's bow one last time. <clears throat> our God and our Father, we thank you for Jesus one more time. We're thankful that uh, he delivered us. We live in anticipation of his return. We long to see him in the clouds, returning uh, to deliver us uh, and bring us into your abode for all eternity. So thankful for him. We offer this prayer in his name. Amen.
Tuyo por este video. Stand the rock before Rick brings us a message this morning. There stands a rock on shores of time that rears to
Well, good morning. We uh, have some visitors with us and we're thankful. We also have a ton of people who are traveling. So it's nice to have uh, some of the pews filled in by guests. And there's a whole lot of going for the, for the holidays and traveling. Appreciate the songs that Maverick led. He led two of what our brethren have pulled collectively, suggested are two of the best hymns in all of, of hymnomdom. <laughs> In uh, Hallelujah, What a Savior, and uh, Give Me the Bible. And so those were two fantastic songs for us to be thinking about here this morning. When it comes to our prayers, there's a list of things that might sound familiar to you when it comes to things that we're thankful for. We pray for things like our family, our home, our friends, our job. The country we live in, the medical advances we've got, the food, material blessings, recreational activities. All of these things are, are, are things that I think we pray and are grateful for, and rightly so. We're thankful for those kind of blessings. And all of these things, they come from God, and to, be, to not acknowledge them would be downright sinful and ungrateful, and something that God's people should never, ever engage in. But generally speaking, believers and non-believers alike enjoy these things. If you do a concordant search of the word blessing or blessedness, not one time in the New Testament, at least as far as the New King James goes, are any of the things I just mentioned called blessings. And I tell you what, that just kind of blew my socks off. <laughs> I thought about all the different things that we could talk about. Again, we're talking about families and homes and friends and jobs and food and material things. But the Bible, if you just do a concordance look, that word blessing doesn't appear with that. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not blessings. Please, please understand what I'm saying this morning. The things that we're talking about that I'm mentioning here, are, it's not that they aren't blessings. But it's curious that the Bible doesn't call them such. Something that, like I said, it really, it very much surprised me. As the New Testament uses the word for blessing or blessed or blessedness, we need to understand that the word has a lot to do with the idea of, it goes beyond happiness. It has more to do with the idea of kind of that joyfulness. Someone that's joyful. We've talked before about how happiness is about what happens to you. The truth of the matter is, what happens to us can be changed in an instant. The Bible has never promised us that our happiness will be taken away. It gets taken away all the time. You're, you're walking up your stairs today, about ready to open some presents, and you slip and fall and bounce your head off the, the stairs. Suddenly what's happened to you isn't all that great. Suddenly you got a bloody nose or teeth or something. You know, that can change in an instant, whereas joy... We know Jesus tells the disciples, your joy I'm giving you can never be taken away from you. Joy is that, that mental ascent, that understanding of the truth about who God is, about what he's done for us. The very thing that the Bible tells us that Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. Jesus had joy while on the cross. So we're talking about something that goes beyond just how I feel. Blessings are more than just good stuff that happens to us. And, and there's, a, there's some things that we're going to look at this morning. But I, I just, I want to spend a few minutes with you talking about our truest blessings. And I have a hard time coming up with a title for this because I, again, I don't want to <clears throat> undermine the fact that food and clothing and shelter are blessings. They are. Please don't walk away thinking that Rick thinks that you know, the material stuff that we're blessed with, that they're just not blessings. No, I do. And I believe the Bible would, would consider that as well. But just knowing the times where that word pops up, blessing or blessed, blessedness, I find it very revealing that it's connected with stuff that's a little different than what we might think of. And on a day when there is a lot of of, you know, tearing into presents and, and exciting things that we're getting and, and gifts from loved ones and food and, and friendship and things like that, things that are blessings, we are tempted in a very materialistic society to lose sight of what I want to suggest are the, the, the truest blessings, the ones that are eternal, the ones that are going to last. 
And we can kind of get caught up in the stuff that we know we can't carry with us. So I just want to think about that with you this morning. And you know, I certainly have benefited greatly from this study, and I hope that you will as well. I think a point that is very important is right off the right off the bat, we need to establish that blessedness has very little to do with our stuff. The word stuff is such a great word. Because what what, what do you call the nebulous things around our lives, the fringes that are there are things that, that we enjoy, but they don't really have a whole lot, add a whole lot of meaning to our life. They may make us happy in the moment. But I think about things like my hobbies, my, my, my movies, my video games, my music, uh, my, my sports. There, there's a lot of different things that I like and I enjoy that fill my time, but they're stuff. <laughs> okay? And so our, our lives are not mainly about those kind of things. And the Bible makes it clear that our blessedness is not going to come from all that. Look at Matthew 6, verse 25. We're going to look at a few verses here rapidly. Matthew 6, verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Jump down to verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Verse 31, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Jesus tells us very plainly that, in fact, he promises to us that if we seek God, these things will be provided food and clothing, so that we'll have the things that we need. The world does not have that promise. People on the outside who, who do not follow God, this is not their promise because it's those who seek the kingdom first. That's why Jesus says, seek the kingdom first, and God will provide all these things for you. But what happens when people are not seeking the kingdom first, they're seeking all these other things, well, it's what's, what so oftentimes happens is that there's the falling short of even attaining those very, very necessities sometimes. Now, we got to be careful that we don't assign um, a certain kind of value to the necessities. Sometimes necessities, people think they need that Porsche <laughs> or that second home in Florida or whatever. And we're not talking about something like that. We're talking about the things that we need. And let's face it, as human beings, we can get away with a lot of stuff that, that we think we need that we actually don't. But God makes those promises to you. So uh, he says, I will take care of those things. You seek me. You strive for what I have to offer. Look over in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. The world assesses its value from possessions. And we, we all know what it's like to, to have the, the things that, that make us feel good. I, you know, we feel really good about the, the new van that we bought. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, we've been for about two years now, we've been afraid that the old one would just blow up on us, and so we finally got in a financial position where we could, could do this, and so we're so thankful for something that's supposed to work well for a while, and you know, you feel a little bit of the pride, right, until the first kid scrapes their bike along the side of it. Ah, it's a big scratch, there's a dent, or there's a, you know, a rock comes flying up in the windshield of dents, and that's going to happen, and so I can't assign my value, the value of my family, based on the things I possess. Jesus says, that's just not how it works. A man's life is not about what he has or doesn't have. And that's hard for me sometimes because I see the world around me and I see how much people do assign value. Our kids in school, oh man, the certain kind of clothes you wear, what brand it is. and There's just so many levels of nuance to what kids are judged by. And it's all about stuff and how it looks and what brand it is and how expensive it is. It's possessions, and their value is oftentimes judged by their peers about those, you know, based on those things. That's why the poor kids usually get picked on. Because, well, they don't have much, therefore they're not worth much. No, 
That's why the adults come along and instruct them otherwise. But yet that's our world. And it's easy for any of us to, to feel that pressure. I'm not saying it's wrong to feel good about a new vehicle or a new house. No, I, but we understand that's not, that's not the value I have. Because what happens when this new van we've got in 20 years from now is lying in a junkyard? Does that mean my life is no, more, no longer worth anything? Of course not. But that's the temptation. I feel it. I suspect I'm not the only one that, that feels that. But we're working to try to see things the way Jesus does. Jesus says that judging ourselves by our possessions is a faulty standard of measure. You know, blessedness comes from some really strange places. We're not going to read Matthew 5, but just think about Matthew 5, that we call the Sermon on the Mount, the beginning part of that, and the Beatitudes. Do you know how weird those are? You ever notice the things that Jesus says? They're just, they're, they're downright batty in comparison to the wisdom of the world. Some of the things that Jesus says, he says, those who are poor in spirit, they are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, this certainly carries with it the idea of humility, but it goes much farther beyond that. It actually carries with it, I'm told, the idea of someone who is trampled underfoot or run over. I love the story A Christmas Carol. I, I, it's only about a three-hour read. I encourage you to do it. It's fun. I love it. It gets me in, in the heart feels every time. It always brings a little tear to my eye. I love the story of, of redemption, right? I mean, redemption is kind of what we're all about. And the person that comes to my mind when I think about poor in spirits, go Bob Cratchit and his family. <laughs> the man who is constantly being trampled underfoot by his super rich boss and, and the rich culture and society that he's in. Him and his family, they're, they're stepped on, they're, they're ignored, but they're happy. They're happy with each other. They're happy with the smallest of things because they're together and, and, and they're thankful to God. That's the poor in spirit. People who are, are trampled underfoot by others and still have that sense of gratitude. They're not angry and upset. They're not uh, discontented. Jesus says, those, that's where blessedness is found, being poor in spirit. What? How about the, those who mourn? Randy mentioned it earlier, but it's exactly right. What I was thinking about with this point is, better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. The house of mourning is a place where we all have the chance to consider our mortality, where we all have the chance to recognize that the reason people die is because of sin. You and I have got to be reminded of that. How often we forget. How often the world forgets. We become so accustomed to death that we forget we were not made to die. Do you know that? Do, do we understand that? You were not made to die. You were made to live. We die because we brought sin into the world and ignored God's commandments. And so now all flesh dies. But that is not what we had in the beginning. You and I were made to live in fellowship with God, peacefully, without sin and death. Well, we, we changed that big time with the terrible choices we've made. And so we, when we come and we see death, it ought to be a reminder, whether it's something as small as the death of a pet, all the way up to the death of a human being, death was not a part of the world God first made. It's certainly not the way it is now. And so it's a chance to teach and educate. Oh, we were, we've lost this, this thing, this creature that we love so much. And we see what it does to his body and all oh, that's so horrible. That's right. How about what it does to a human being? Death is this, this evil, invasive thing that is unnatural. People talk about, oh, death's a part of the natural process. No, it's not. Death is unnatural. And so we mourn because we recognize that sin is the reason these things happen. And so for those of us who, who mourn and, and recognize what sin has done, Jesus says, you're blessed. What? Well, people these days, they'd just rather close our eyes and say, no, these things are, are totally antithetical to happiness. But that's not what God says. How about the meek? 
If you ever have a hard time defining me, because I have, I'll share with you the definition that a preacher gave me once that's always stuck. He said, think of a bridled horse. Think about this creature that is many times more powerful than you are, that allows you to put a bit in its mouth, saddle it up and ride it, and tell it where you want it to carry you. Now, at any moment, that animal could buck you off, trample all over and kill you, but it doesn't. Its strength is reserved. It's, it's, it's meek. It has taken in its strength and harnessed it and basically given it to you. That's the idea of meekness. For, for any rights, you think about well, what kind of strength can we be talking about here? Well, I mean, some of us may be physically more strong than others, but there are often legal, legal matters and rights and privileges. There are things that we do have that we have to make a decision, are we going to, to use those or not? And meekness says, there, I have the ability to enforce my will upon somebody or to do something, but I don't do that. In a culture that is obsessed with our rights, the Christian bows and says, I will show you that preference. That's hard. But that's what the Christian does. That's what love does. Love says, I'm going to, yes, do I have a right to stand up and say something about this and to, to fight this? Well, technically, but that's not going to glorify God. We can have the attitude, all things are lawful for me, as Paul said. But then Paul also said, but not all things edify. I love that approach when it comes to something like alcohol. I hate alcohol. I hate it. But I can't condemn it across the board like I want to. Because I know the Bible talks about people using it. And we know that it, that it was, in fact, somewhat intoxicating. It had a small amount of alcohol. I want to be able to say, let's say it to the Lord, all alcohol is bad unless it's medicinal. I can't do that, honestly. But what I can do is look at the, the idea of someone who says, all things are lawful for me. Okay, yeah, maybe there are things you can do, but not all things are edifying. And now I'm happy to do that to someone who's maybe pushing alcohol and say, not all things are edifying, but then can I turn around and do that for myself? Do I have the meekness to say, Rick, just because you've got the right doesn't mean you do it. That's the meekness thing. Jesus says meekness is what wins the day. Several passages here I want us to look at. James chapter 1 and verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Times where we see blessedness specifically cited. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The man who endures temptation is blessed. Blessed? Temptation. That's insane. A couple chapters over. James 5, verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. We have heard of the perse you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Jump over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 in verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Uh, chapter 4, verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of, of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he's blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. And, and we could probably find other passages that say some of these things, but the idea of temptation and trials, that these things are, are meant to, to, we're to see these as blessings, things, things that make us blessed. What? <laughs> How is that possible? Well, for starters, it, it requires a shift in our paradigm, doesn't it? I don't view trials in the moment as a blessing. I don't. And you know what? I don't think God expects us to see it that way necessarily. I think after it's over, that we can then step back and hopefully look at that. But of course, we still have to be successful in those trials. What we have to do is keep our heads down and trust God knows what he's doing. 
and that at the end of things that we'll have the clarity, hopefully, to see and to learn from it and grow. But let me tell you, in the heat of the moment, those trials, those temptations, they don't feel like blessings. They feel like curses. This isn't what I signed up for, Lord. Actually, it is. Because the man who endures temptation is blessed. The woman who perseveres through the hardship and trials, she's blessed. But is that how the world sees things? No, of course not. That's not even how my inner self naturally sees things. I have to retrain my inner self to see that. That's a lot of work for me. I don't know about you. That's a lot of work for me. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. After telling everybody there to lay aside all the malice and deceit, hypocrisy, all these bad things, says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow in thereby, if indeed you have tasted the Lord is gracious. There is this need, this hunger for us to, to be, to draw near to God, understanding the necessity we have for his word, that if we're going to be successful in laying aside all the things that he mentions in verse 1, because those things are those are what come naturally, right? Being angry and spiteful and seeking vengeance, those are the things that satisfy that inner man. But we have to have that, that childlike faith, Lord, give me more of your word, which teaches me to stay away from those things, because it's antithetical to what I feel a lot of times. And how hard, how difficult that can be. Much like in the first century, um, the, the places that I have gone overseas, I can't speak for Jeremy, but I think he, he would say the same thing. The places that I have gone and preached overseas, uh, the poverty level among our brethren is quite staggering. I wish I could take people with me uh, just for the week that I'm down there. I'm not down there very long, but just get a chance to see our brothers and sisters and what they live in. And you know one of the things that really struck me, and this is, this is just the education of Rick Boswell right here. I saw a man, a brother, a very zealous brother, who lived in a, in a city called La Union. His name was Luis. And he had four walls and half a floor. Half of, his, half of his, the floor of his house was just missing. And right below that floor was open sewage because he lived in this little village, La Union, over a gigantic open sewer. So, never mind the danger for just a moment of all the nasty things that, that you are very close to. Just the smell was staggering to me. And what blew me away more was not only did Luis have this incredible, and his family, he had a family that was living there, not only did they have this incredible generosity and love, but he took in a man, a shoeshine boy that had recently been converted, who had literally nowhere to live. And so he was living with Luis, and this guy felt like he was on cloud nine. I recognized these people, they were blessed. They said they were blessed. They knew they were blessed. They felt they were blessed. And it finally dawned on me, well, if, if I'm blessed, and I have everything, and they're blessed, and they have nothing, well, blessing must have something to do with other than stuff, which kind of goes back to that first point. And that just really, really hit me hard about how much I, because I don't want to trade places with them. I don't, I still don't. But from heaven's perspective, and this is where it really nailed me, from heaven's perspective, we are both equally blessed. And yet our materialistic situations are polar opposites. And I, I just, I stepped back and I thought, my, my standard of looking at all this is just wrong. It's backwards. And I'm still to this day, that was my first trip, that was 2009, man, that's 13 years ago. 13 years ago, and I'm still wrestling with the fact that I understand that there are 
things that, that I look at myself and I feel more blessed than others. The truth of the matter is, yes, there is truth to that. I need to be grateful for what God's given me, realizing there's nothing about me that's more worthy than Luis. There's nothing about you that's more worthy than Luis. But our God has put things into our hands, and so we need to be stewards of those things, and that's a, a discussion for another time. But what it does tell me is that the blessings, the blessedness that I feel in my superiority over Luis, why I wouldn't trade places with him, has nothing to do with our spiritual state, but everything to do with our physical one. And I have to learn to recognize the difference there. Luis is blessed because he is a child of God and because of what he knows. The joy he has that he will trade in his earthly existence and all the things that he doesn't have and become an heir of eternity. That he is that and I am too. And so when everything is laid out, all this stuff I have that he doesn't, I'm not taking it with me, neither are you. We are all equal in the sight of God in, in terms of the, the blessedness that we have. The difference is what kind of stewards are we? And I, don't, I, I might be repeating myself here, but I'm just I'm trying to, to give you that sense of what I think is just so profound. Our blessings don't have to do with our stuff. Yeah, they are blessings. But what the Bible emphasizes as blessedness doesn't have anything to do with our stuff. Because if it did, then Lu how could Luis be blessed considering how little he's got compared to me? Right? And then how can I consider I'm blessed compared to the billionaires out there and what they've got? But that's the wrong standard of measure. Our truest blessings, the ones that are lasting, have nothing to do with the material things that usually get most of the praise. Even in our discussions about our collection, we are right to acknowledge that we are giving a portion of what God has given back to us, of our material blessings. But let's make sure that we're understanding that our giving is also to reflect our spiritual blessedness, not simply our checkbook. That we are giving a portion that we feel like is, is an adequate expression a snapshot of how God has blessed us materially, but then how about the spiritual blessings? Do those count too. <laughs> the ones that are our lasting and the ones that are eternal. And I think that should have some impact on our giving as well, shouldn't it? I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, I feel like that's a big part of it. Because the greatest blessings, uh, blessings I have are things that I can't carry with me. Or, excuse me, are things that I can carry with me that that don't end up being a part of the, the roll call, if you will, of stuff that we oftentimes in a rich culture put most of our emphasis on. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, is that it's, it's tempting to put the emphasis on the stuff that doesn't last. And I want us to see how God is trying to, to show us even more what our, what our blessedness is. This is an important point, too, I think, that comes through in our walk with Jesus, is that blessedness comes from the things that we are doing. I've always thought of blessings as things that, that happen to me. But the New Testament emphasizes, actually, what we end up doing for others. Listen to these passages. We read this a little bit ago, Luke chapter 11. Jesus, in his ministry... And the, the praise that was being heaped upon him, Luke chapter 11, verse 27. Luke eleven twenty seven 27 is, And it happened as he spoke these things, and a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the wound that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. I can imagine Jesus' face beaming when this woman says that, not out of pride. But she was, she was, she was blessing her God, her creator, her, her hero, whether she realized it or not. She was blessing him and saying, blessed is the womb 
that, that the woman that bore you, and you know what? The Bible even proclaims that. The Holy Spirit made sure people had honored and praised Mary for, for who she was, and she, she was given great glory. Jesus, I can imagine him hearing her say that and smiling and saying, even more, blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. I can just see him building that momentum from what she said. She's feeling that emotion of, wow, what a remarkable man you are. Your mother must be proud. And he says, do you want to talk about pride or, or joy yeah. in delighting in a child? The father delights in those who do his will. That's basically what he's saying. Those are the ones who are blessed. That's where that focus can be. James, or excuse me, John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. As Jesus is teaching and really in this context instructing his disciples about uh, you know, wash their feet and the, the, the servant-master relationship that that we are to be a kingdom of servants. He says, blessed are you, are you if, if you, you know these things and if you do them. To put these things into practice. James chapter 1, verse 25. I know I'm throwing a lot of verses at you here, but I hope this helps to, to cement this. James chapter 1, verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. All of these passages stress that real blessedness comes from doing God's will. Trusting his commands, that is real happiness. We sing the song, Trust and Obey. <laughs> There's no other way. And the song is not telling us that we have some blind faith. Sometimes people, oh, religion's all about people just taking these blind jumps. Uh, no, it's not. Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There is plenty of evidence to make to draw the conclusions that we draw based on what the Bible tells us, the things that have happened in history. But yes, there is still that the element of faith to that, absolutely. Deciding whether or not the, the words that we read and the, the things that we process, whether they are true or not, and deciding that we're going to base our lives on those things, that those blessings have everything to do with trusting that God knows what he's talking about. And kind of a sub point to this is also the idea of us being a blessing to others. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Verse 35. Paul says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. You knew that verse was coming, right? <laughs> As a child, this always blew me away. I, I, did, I just didn't believe it, especially on a day like today when the getting was good. <laughs> the presents flowed and children... We were teaching children the joy of giving. But right now, it's more the receiving part, and that's just a part of maturing, right? But I didn't, I just remember thinking to myself for a long time, I just don't understand that. As I've gotten older, I'm still working on it, because I still like to receive. But the joy that I get in seeing good I've done for others is pretty powerful. The joy of, of pleasing my wife or, or seeing my children engage in something they like, the joy they get from an ice cream cone on a hot day as it melts all over their faces in the back of my new van. That's another thing that will make the new van not so new anymore. The joy that you see in, in people seeing you, you lift them up and you say something that they've never thought about before and wow, I really appreciate that, Rick. Those are the kind of things I love for. Being able to see people encouraged and built up. It's what I do. It's why I do what I do. 
I want to see people getting stronger and better and being encouraged by something that I have helped them to do. And it is truly a food for the soul. But it, it takes some trust, though, doesn't it? It goes against the norm. Even at this time of year, the season of giving, what do you see on a lot of the commercials? Ah, buy something for yourself. Too. Don't forget about yourself. They can't get away from the fact that you still have to look out for number one. It's impossible for people to say it's all about others. Well, it's mostly about others, but it's also about you. They just can't do it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of humorous, but it's also kind of a, a microcosm of the problem. That we're still fighting with whether or not giving ourselves completely to God and to others is really the way to go. I know I am. Maybe somebody here is as well. Nevertheless, it is what we are trying to become. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Romans 12, verse 14. Jesus says, or Jesus, Paul says some weird stuff. Jesus through Paul, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. First Peter, first Peter chapter 3, verse 9. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Peter talks about not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this that you may inherit a blessing. That the challenge of even going a step further of not only giving, but giving and being a blessing to others who don't love you at all. That's, that's one that we can spend a lot of time talking about. We still not ever really scratch the surface of the difficulties. But that's a blessing. Again, just looking at these words, that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm throwing these all these different passages about blessings out there and noticing how the material stuff isn't what the emphasis is. It's on the eternal things. It's on the things that make us better and more like God. That ultimately, the more we become like Yahweh, the better things become. Because we were born as his imagers, we are his children. Therefore, if we behave the way that we were intended, we will find the most satisfaction going down that path. Take some faith, take some trust, but that is ultimately what we're seeing. Well, real quick here, over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, The blessedness, really the thing that sums it all up is what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And he goes on to list a whole bunch of other things that ends up communicating that point. We all recognize that service to God does render material blessings, and it does give us things that, that are good that make us happy but that are temporary and it's appropriate to honor God to praise him and to thank him for that and if we don't we are thankless and we are going down the road to destruction please 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 don't misunderstand what I'm saying I've had this happen before with this this kind of idea where people think I'm just saying the blessings that have to do with physical stuff are not blessings. Of course they are. Be grateful for them. Praise God for them. Use them wisely. But th there are blessings. But I think that there is, there are levels to blessings. And the blessings that should be our highest focus, our highest hope, are the ones that Paul talks about here, those blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, the things that come from being in Jesus. 
Okay, and you can just read the rest of that. Read through verse 14. It's all one sentence. Verse 3 to verse 14 is all one sentence in Greek, I'm told. I had to memorize it down, down in Dr. Petty's class down at FC. He talks about all those amazing things that are in Christ. Salvation and inheritance and a birthright. We have a name. We are a people. We are all, all these different things that we have because we are in Christ. That blessedness. Those are found in Jesus, and they are found nowhere else. Not on a Christmas tree, not on a bank, not in the government locked up somewhere in Area 51. <laughs> these are only in Jesus. And it just so happens that these blessings are eternal. They're the ones that will never fail. And so as we Think about, can't help but think about this time of year. I, I want us to, I want us to be grateful for everything we have been given, everything. To praise God for all blessings, near and far, small and big. But may God help us to see our truest blessings. The ones the Bible talks about, it just, it calls a blessing giving to others, serving others, being like Jesus, that those things, that eternal inheritance, that that's what our highest blessings are. And let's make sure that if those highest blessings are truly of the weight and value that we, we place on them, that we praise him for such. Because I don't know about you, but I just can't thank God enough for my hero, as Randy was saying. I like to think of Jesus as my champion. Champion, the one who has done everything. Randy was mentioning in Hebrews that Jesus becoming the author. If I'm not mistaken, that word is literally a trailblazer. Jesus blazed the trail for us to get back to where we're supposed to be. That is worthy of more praise than I can ever shower upon him. So let's make sure in a season where we're, we're mindful of blessings and time of family and friends, things that are, are truly gifts from God, let's make sure that the highest blessings, eternal life with him, that those are at the very top of our thank you list. And that we don't get caught up in the stuff that doesn't last too much. <laughs> You have the opportunity this morning to put on Jesus Christ, to be baptized into him, and to make yourself an heir of those eternal, everlasting blessings that we were talking about a second ago. Do you understand that you're a sinner? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Are you willing to confess that before men? Are you ready to repent and say, I'm turning away from the life of sin. I know I've done wrong. I don't want to do this anymore. I've tried it my way. Now I'm going to try it God's way. Then you're ready to be immersed in the watery grave of baptism. Have your sins washed away. We are ready to help you. Are you ready to have your sins forgiven? If as a Christian there's something that you're struggling with, something that is, is a, tr a, a, a trial for you, troublesome, maybe sin in your life, or the consequences of the sin in other people's lives affecting you. And we will pray for you, we'll encourage you, or if you just need help focusing a little bit more on the, the highest and truest blessings, and we'll encourage you and, and walk with you in that too. Let us know what you need and come forward one of these front pews as we stand and sing.
us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you at this time thanking you for this hour of worship that you've given us that we can come and sing praises to you. We uh, thank you, dear Lord, for all the many blessings that you have given us, the spiritual and the physical. We pray that you'll be with us, Lord, though, as we journey through our life, that we will focus, you will help us focus on the spiritual blessings that you give us, the ones that matter, the ones that are lasting, and to not focus so much on the physical blessings that it distracts us. We thank you, dear Lord, for the greatest blessing of sending your son down to be our savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Each Lord's Day, we present an offering to God, and it's part of our group participation as we seek to uh, support uh, the growth of the kingdom in this area in Portage, and then also to help others across the world as there are special needs. Um, this is the work of this uh, local congregation, so if you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know you're under no obligation or even expectation to give. We don't pass the plate here since not in COVID, but we have plates that are at the doors, and those are for our members. If you do, as a visitor, choose to give, just know that we'll use that in a way that's in keeping with what the Bible says and in a way that helps grow the kingdom. My comments before uh, we give our offering today are kind of in line with what uh, Rick said, just a really excellent message to remind us of what our true blessings are. Uh, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says this to his disciples. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has gladly chosen to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourself purses which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How many of y'all have a wallet or a purse with you today? <clears throat> Nobody, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, I have mine with me. I imagine uh, most, maybe some of you even might have gotten a, a new wallet or a purse for uh, the holiday. But uh, it's usually something that we all carry, and they're all probably different. I know Kurt has a really cool one. He's so teeny tiny. He's a, he's a minimalist, and those are becoming popular. I think you have those. Um, others have like walking stores. I know moms are great about this. You know, you, anything you need, you just ask mom and it's in there. Some keep it nice and neat. Others, it's a mess, it's bulging. Uh, where we carry them, some women carry them on their arms or uh, men in their back pocket. I'm a front pocket guy because I'm afraid I'll lose mine. Uh, I know losing your wallet can be a traumatic thing. Julian lost his this last school year and it was a near disaster. <clears throat> um, Wallets are highly specialized and personalized, but one thing they all have in common is that generally over time they wear out. I, I know I can use a new one. I, I didn't get one this year, but mine is really falling apart. Um, I want to get to where I can be like Kurt and just have like three things in it. But, um, in this passage, Jesus mentions something that's really amazing, and that is a wallet or a purse that never wears out. And uh, that's uh, something that can't be lost or stolen uh, or destroyed. Wouldn't it be great to have something like that? Of course, Jesus is not talking about a physical wallet or purse. He's talking about uh, something spiritual, a heavenly account of, for all of our faithfulness and good works. And he refers to an unfailing treasure in heaven. And that is not material. Those are all those spiritual blessings. It's love and joy and peace and fellowship with God and with his people and forgiveness and living a life of hope and joy. Those are things that you can't put in a wallet. But uh, I love that phrase, that, or that you've heard me say this many times, uh, and you, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Um, your blessings. If we invest, if we put our, uh, our heart and our treasure in heaven, and we do that because we are blessed, I, I, I guess. We, those good things that we do, those acts of kindness, that giving to charity and offering our material blessings, it's because 
And what we recognize that those things are not, the, the material blessings are not enough. They cannot add. Uh, but it's good to be reminded, as we have been today by a brother, that where we want our, our treasure to be is in heaven and for our hearts to be there as well. One way we do that is by our collective um, uh, support of the work of the kingdom. And we do this because we believe it. We believe that it has value. It touches people's lives. It saves souls. It helps people get to heaven. That's what we're all about as a fellowship. Uh, and while it's nice to have this building and warm, and that is a, a blessing to us, it's not about stuff. It's about souls. And so um, may God bless our efforts to build treasures in heaven um, for ourselves and for others that they might be there as well. Let's bow and I'll offer a short prayer. Dear God, we're thankful for the blessings that transcend all the material things. You give us wonderful things in this world that you've made, that just gives glory to you. But we realize that in the end, we will be consumed. What will be left is you and uh, our souls, and we seek to be there with you. We pray that we might um, help as many as we can to be there as well, that we might be lights and salt uh, to this world. We pray that our efforts to um, advance your son's kingdom would be effective, and that we might do good things to your glory and to the salvation of ourselves and others. We pray your blessings upon us in this effort in Jesus' name. Amen. Final song this morning is "He's My King."